Appreciate that, Darren. Next up is uh, Kevin Coleman. Kevin is a C uh, senior fellow at the Technolytics Institute and an instructor with our good friends at uh, CypherPath LLC. Let's see if all this works now. Nope, that's not mine. There we go. It's up on the monitor, but not. There we go. Well, good morning. Hopefully you're finding this uh, interesting. My uh, little presentation is going to be a lot different than what you've heard before. We're going to talk about the creativity of hackers and why we continuously fall victim to them. And we're also going to talk about what I've termed security uh, absurdity in the way in which we're approaching this problem. And hopefully that will give you some ideas for your competition coming up. If you look at it, every time we have a security event, it points out either something somebody did or somebody didn't do. And if you look at uh, the, all the stats that are out there, and there's, there's buku stats of, about this, the security events continue to grow even though we continue to put more and more dollars toward this. Look at the stats in, in the first seven months you know, uh, of 2011. It was 56% over the entire previous year. That tells you we're not doing something right. It keeps getting worse and we're spending more and more money on this. If you look at it, the healthcare industry is about $2.5 trillion portion of the economy. That's a lot of money when we have to protect all that. And it generates huge amounts of data that we talked about before. The company I was consulting to had to accelerate their movement to imaging and digital records. Look at the reason. The floor started to buckle under the weight of the paper. That shows you just how much paper is being produced still in our hospitals, even though we're moving to the electronic records and everything else. If you look at it, implementing electronic health records has you know, great benefits, but it also has some huge issues and security concerns. We won't get into all those. Everybody's talked about them uh, to nauseam. And that's what we do. We talk about it. We don't address it. Cybersecurity incidents, they're unavoidable. If you look at it, the year-over-year -year data speaks for itself, and the average healthcare institution has four breaches a year. Now, how many of those get reported? There's a great report that's going to be published later this week uh, over in the European uh, conference that says the government, when they, they looked at the government and the, all the government's uh, security measures and everything else, only 16% of the security requirements were met. 16% of what they said they uh, achieved and was built in, 16% were met. We're fooling ourselves. And that doesn't bode well for security. Look at what we're losing annually, $6.5 billion. Here's an interesting model that we put together so everybody can understand, and we've heard the previous speakers talk about patches and everything else, and there's some real issues here. You're sitting there in operation, there's a vulnerability that gets discovered, patch deployed, so that's kind of like the high-level process. The way in which we talk about the, the clock starts here when the vulnerability is discovered and it gets announced. 21 days later, and this is an actual incident, and this was a good, you know, real fast turnaround by the, the software company, they provided a patch for this particular vulnerability. It took the organization an additional 33 days to test that patch in their environment. You can't just apply the patch. There's all this custom code that's been written. And, and this may be a newsflash for you, when Microsoft releases a patch, they tend to break other things. Now, I, I will tell you this, I, I was a chief strategist at Netscape, so I might be a little bit jaundiced when it comes to dealing with Microsoft. 
So right there, you've got a total of 54 days from the time that we publicly announced to the entire hacker community a vulnerability that exists out there before you get, can get a patch applied in this instance. That's the way we talk about it. That's what we talk about exposure, that length of time. It's a fallacy. Here's why. This particular flaw was traced back and the flaw occurred nine years earlier and has been in every piece of software ever since. Every release. Now, if you think about the hacker community, do you think they just sit there and wait for somebody to release a vulnerability? Those are the ones that are lazy that the one speaker talked about. But the ones we need to worry about are the ones that are sitting out there researching and finding the vulnerabilities in the software. Stuxnet was talked about earlier. It used four previously unknown vulnerabilities in that software. Somebody researched and identified those four vulnerabilities. That's what we need to look at. This is the true model and the length of exposure that we see in a lot of cases, not the 54 days. Something to think about. This was an actual incident we got brought in uh, a Case officer from the CIA actually brought us in on this particular one. A company was doing just a phenomenal amount of research, and they spent years and years and years in this research effort. And they were collecting all this intellectual property. Well, unbeknownst to them, they'd been hacked, and there was a cyber spy looking at the intellectual property. At some point in time, they decided that they would test this and actually, they decided it was a good idea, and they would hurry up and apply for a patent, an international patent. Well, these guys decided the same thing. They started their commercialization process. They filed a patent. Well, in the meantime, the patent was awarded to the uh, foreign country that fi filed for the international patent. These guys got notified, and just they started to take a look at this and said, this is too similar. How did this happen? They found the breach. Well, these guys started licensing the patent to everybody around the world, and these guys had to go to their board and tell them that those years of research and those hundreds of millions of dollars that they spent on this was wasted because they couldn't recognize the value from it. Now, here's why the CIA was involved. That particular cyber attack came from my friends in China. Now, here's why they asked me about this. In some uh, cyber attack simulation, um, I did something that they found rather interesting. We intercepted the outbound on, uh, that of a hack that was going to a foreign country. And it was also a chemical formula. Well, we brought in some chemists, and we asked them, how do we change this formula so if they try to produce it, it would blow up? Now, naturally, things that go boom is a real, real, real interest to, to the folks at the CIA, and when they tie that to cyber, it's like, wait a second, you're turning this, uh, a cyber attack into an offensive weapon? It says, yeah, why not? We can tell when information's leaving our system, and what do we do? Nothing. Nothing. How many people have heard of snort? It's a firewall, right? Protects on the inbound. We have trons. Snort backwards. We protect the stuff that's going out. We take a look at all the stuff going out to IP addresses and ask, why is it going there? If we haven't authorized it, we make certain modifications to it. That's being used in a lot of very interesting applications right now. So it's changing the model. It's thinking differently. And I want to commend hackers. I used to be one. I was actually Dr. Uh, Ralph Semmel from APL. I was doing a briefing here a while back. Uh, and he asked me when I hacked my first computer. It was in 1983. Most of you weren't even on this planet in 1983. It was over a 300-baud acoustically coupled dial-up modem. And it was an IBM 360 mainframe that I got into. Things have changed since then, but you know what? It's creativity that stays constant. We looked at the, there was a 
economic crisis, and we looked at this particular incident because this shows hacker creativity. And, and I gotta tell you, if there was an Academy Award, this one would get it. They looked at it and they thought, you know, did, we need to target this and take advantage of this incident. It's got everybody on the edge, the financial crisis, housing is going down, you know, the financial institutions are in trouble, the mortgage industry is in trouble. So they carefully crafted a phishing email and sent it out to executives. We're talking the CEO level. And the email looked as if it came from the Department of Justice and it was an electronic subpoena. And it had a link to the electronic subpoena. Now, 90% of the executives did what? If you're in their shoes and you're in this housing crisis and everything else, you're gonna be a little bit on edge, aren't you? They clicked on it and they got infected. Now, of the remaining folks who didn't click on it, they sent it to their lawyers. The majority of the lawyers clicked on it and they got infected. <laughs> That's creativity, look at that. How sophisticated was this? The trick was to get them to click on the link, right? Just think about it. That is really a work of art. They really did a good job on this. You know, backdrop to the competition in healthcare, I thought uh, I would bring up some real life experiences. Uh, and we have uh, been brought in by some critical infrastructure providers to give some advice. And we started to look at the, the healthcare organizations and we immediately got sick. Security in hospitals is not where it needs to be by a far stretch. Um, putting proper security measures in place, doctors are the biggest problem. They don't want this. In fact, you'll see a couple of quotes in a rather intense conversation I have with one of them shortly. The medical equipment vendors, we, they, they talked about uh, vulnerabilities and everything else. How many people know that those complex treatment devices, the equipment that's in the hospitals, have wireless cellular modems built into them so that the people who manage those systems and can make tweaks and everything else that design engineers can call in remotely and they aren't obstructed by firewalls? Anybody see an issue with that? The chief information security officer didn't know those modems existed. We picked it up doing a wireless scan and we kept seeing these cellular signals and we didn't know what they were. That's how we found out. They went back to the vendor and they said, oh yeah, we don't wanna to have to deal with your firewall. Now, you guys probably don't remember the movie War Games. Could use an auto dialer to automatically what? Identify phone numbers where there was a computer that answered the other end. How hard is that to do? Software's out there for free. The cost of security compliance is breaking the CISO's budget. There was a new reg that came out, the CISO looked at it, said, well, that's just something else I can't afford to comply with right now. And he's right. There's a difference between security and compliance. You can be compliant and not be secure. Question for you. What's the difference between a medical doctor and, and a terrorist? Does anybody know? Anyone? Nah, whoop. You can negotiate with the terrorists. <laughs> I'm not joking. These guys you can't negotiate with. I had the most intense conversation with an MD who swore to me, D-R-O-W-S-S-A-P, in all caps, was a complex password. What's that backwards? Password. Jesus. The auto logout function on his computer was a productivity killer. This is the mentality that we're dealing with, and you wonder why there's insecurity when it comes to our systems. Medtronic's insulin pump hack, you can take a look at this. Here's what really bugs me. This was pointed out over a year ago and it's still vulnerable. The, the exploit still exists there. We've known about it for a year and we took no action. Why? This 
think about this. One third of all data security breaches occur in the healthcare industry. Did you know that? Everybody's going after the data. The non-malicious outside insider. There was a group of consultants came in. It was at the same facility we caught the wireless cellular modems in the treatment equipment. And we're doing the scan and we picked up a wireless modem that wasn't supposed to be there. And we searched around, searched around. It was hidden behind a chair. The consultants put it in so they could communicate. What's interesting was this particular organization, uh, where this was, was on the executive floor. Chief medical officer, the CEO, the CIO, chief legal officer, and everybody else. A very sense of conversations going on in terms of electronic email and everything else. When they plugged into the hospital's network, they exposed everybody. What was even better was their competition was one floor above them. Great. Just put it there so everybody can see it. How hard is it to see a wireless network and the traffic going across? There's network sniffers that do that all the time. The malicious outside insider, this was an individual that was brought in, hired by a very reputable placement firm. He was a temporary resource, brought in the IT department. He set up a server and was FTPing massive amounts of data going outside. We caught him because we were monitoring stuff going outside. When we started to do the, the background research and bring in the FBI on this particular incident, we found out that this guy had done something very similar before. The organization that uh, we hired him through for a temporary worker never did a background check. Simple things. We just absolutely just ignored them. Medical school researchers, these guys plugged the server into the network. Absolutely unknown to the IT organization. They put a wireless system in place. And look what, everybody had the same username and password and it had administrator privileges. Not good. Albert Einstein, you know, he's been around for a long time and, and he actually uh, said, you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. We're doing that in security. Just think about this. We have to know about the attack before we create the signatures that go into our security software nowadays. So an attack has to have, have taken place. We are 100% reactive to security measures instead of being proactive. You know, I actually had a different one up here and I decided to change it last minute just because of where we're at. I actually, how many people have heard of a comedian by the name of Ron White, raise your hands. He did a tour, and a friend of mine has his uh, tour poster up in his office. The tour's name was You Can't Fix Stupid. That seems to apply to a lot of the security events that we have. So this is where everybody here comes in. If you look at it, in the near term, we got to develop something other than signature-based security, and I'm a big fan of behavioral-based modeling. We started looking at this in security back in 2001. We've got to get to a predictive model rather than the reactive state that we're in right now. To address this threat, we're going to need creativity to be applied to this, and we don't have that creativity that's taking place right now. A lot of corporations stifle creativity. Just think about this. If you're in the major league and you're batting 300, you're not right all the time, are you? If you batted 300 in security, is that a good benchmark? No. In corporate America, they expect you to be right, what, 100% of the time. They don't give you the opportunity to try something and fail. But that's what we've got to do in the research, because out of failure, as the one uh, speaker this morning talked, that's where you get the real learning. So creativity and innovation, that's what we've got to have when we're looking at security and we're looking at how to build integrity into our systems. And security and integrity have to be built in. They can't be bolted on later. 
And that's what we do. We bowl on firewalls later on, antivirus, all that stuff's bolded on. We did a, a study that says, on average, in commercial software, okay, and this is software companies that produce, you know, the, uh, the products, there's one error per every 10,000 lines of code remaining after all testing is done and put in production, all right? One per every 10,000 lines of code. Just think about that in the example that was given of the 747, the tens of millions of lines of code there. And what was uh, uh, Windows 8? About 62 million lines of code, I believe. Think about all the bugs that are sitting out there waiting to be discovered. We've got to do something different because what we're doing today does not work. So when you're going in and you're thinking about the attacks in, in uh, you know, your upcoming uh, competition, get creative. The same, same old, same old is not going to be good enough to win this competition. Think out of the box. Think about the vulnerability of the people and what they're most likely to do. And, and profile the individuals who's going to be using the system that you're going to be attacking. That's the way in which to get into these systems. It's not always technical. It's as much of a human uh, systems problem as it is a technical problem. So with that, I'll open it up for some questions, comments, concerns. I stand between you and lunch, so this is not a good position to be in. <laughs> but I'm down here and lunch is that way, so I can't get over the stampede. I yes, sir. Uh, I'm curious if you think we can teach people to, to, to think like the creative hackers, and, and if so, how, how do we do that? What are ways in which we can, you know, create this creativity in cybersecurity education? Creativity, I, I have to say, I think is built into the individual. Uh, we can give them, give them the freedom to be creative. A lot of organizations uh, stifle creativity. Um, the two organizations uh, that I was with as chief strategist, the first was Business Week's 44th fastest growing company because of that creativity factor. The second was Netscape. We grew at 65,000%. Don't ever do that. That hurts. I had a full head of hair when I joined Netscape. You know, this, this, this came from going, Ew! Things we didn't think of. So I don't think we can train it, but we can get out of the way of creativity, and I think we can make a giant step forward by getting out of the way of, of stifling creativity by not you know, uh, celebrating every victory while amashing anybody who actually has a failure. We gotta celebrate failures too in some cases because they lead to breakthroughs. We weren't right all the time at Netscape. And the greatest thing about it was we throw it out on the Netscape portal. If people used it, it became a product. If they didn't, we wrote it off as product development and research. So it's that continuous trial and error that we went through that allowed us to grow at that, that unbelievable rate. Other questions? Scott Dines and Eric Johnson at Dartmouth College did a series of analyses of how healthcare IT was used in a real hospital system. And one of the things they found was similar to what you described at one point, which is systems were, were keeping the medical community from doing what they're used to doing in a hospital. So they would do things like log in in the morning and just keep things logged in so people could just walk up to a system and do their work and then walk away and do whatever else they needed to do. So, <clears throat> so my question to you is, would it be more productive for those of us in security to try harder to understand the business model of how healthcare works so that the security fits more smoothly into what people really get rewarded for? They don't get rewarded for good security, they get rewarded for good health care. And perhaps <clears throat> if, we un <clears throat> excuse me, if we understood the business model, <clears throat> we would do a better job 
of not <clears throat> thinking of the users so much as stupid users, but as people who are just trying to get their jobs done? There's two parts to the, the answer to the, the point that you bring up. One is we have done a lousy job on a security awareness education at all levels. Uh, the executive level is probably the worst. And, and dealing with them at that level uh, is difficult at best. The second thing is um, in our systems that one organization that I most frequent I walk in, I put my thumbprint down, and it automatically logs me on and decrypts the hard drive. How hard is that? It's not. But we haven't educated them that they're not, we're not collecting their fingerprint. It's, it's a, an algorithm of, that, that's matched about my fingerprint. If you had something that was that easy and that quick, do you think the docs would be more likely to use it if we trained them on just how great this would be? Just think about that. How about, you know, we've got retina scans to get in these, these uh, high classified areas. Uh, that's a little bit more difficult, but now we're starting to see some breakthroughs in retina scanning that says you can do it from, you know, 18, 24 inches out reliably. So now you don't have to put your face down in those little goggle things anymore. There's technology that's out there, but we just fail to apply it properly. And, and I think you're right. We've got to understand the context of the business so that the security provides both the, 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 the level needed to protect the data and information that's involved, as well as not inhibiting the users from rapidly assess, uh, accessing these systems. Any other questions, comments? Well, yes, sir. You were talking about the vulnerabilities of uh, software. And uh, having written a lot of software, I know that buffer overflow and that sort of thing are things that you concentrate on. But in what other areas do you see that there's a great problem with uh, software development and the vulnerabilities of it? I don't, th well, let me give you a Netscape example. When we got uh, new software developers, Carnegie Mellon, all the major universities, the high tech ones, we would have to send them through six to eight months training before we would put them on maintenance because they're not trained properly in our schools. The structure of their code is ridiculous. You could not put that stuff in production, it would fail. It's unmaintainable because it's not structured properly. So somehow or other, all the lessons learned from you know, the software engineers at, at Oracle and at Netscape and at Microsoft and everything else are not getting into the classroom. And what we're producing is, is just not appropriate for the level of complexity of the software and the quality that's needed in today's commercial environment. There's an organization out in Salt Lake City, Utah, that uh, unlike regular degrees, you can get a degree kind of like in Microsoft, where all your courses are concentrated on the operating system and some of their other products. Or you can get it in Oracle or IBM or even SAP, I'm told now. I think we need to move more to that type of a model so you understand the inherent structure of the code that you're dealing with, and, and less away from the generality of this is how you put code together? Um, first of all, as a retired primary care physician who now teaches cybersecurity at a community college, I have an interesting schizophrenic pr perspective on this. Um, what advice would you give to students getting into this area? What's the best, I mean, you've given some good advice, but would you have anything uh, concrete you'd wish to say to these students to get them headed in the right direction to get this creativity going, because I see it as a struggle between, of control between IT and the, the user, if you will. Uh, I think it's more uh, of uh, control between IT security and the user, and IT security and the business. Uh, the business doesn't understand IT security, and IT security hasn't taken a whole heck of a lot of time and, and put forth much effort understanding the business side of this. So merging this together, integrating IT into the business process 
uh, and also the business discussions about, well, we need a new system. When is security put in? After the system's already developed, right? Somebody already wrote the code and it gets handed off and then security looks at it and says, here's how we wrap around security. Security's built in, not bolted on. The last time we tried software bolts, it didn't work well. So I, I would say two things. Number one, concentrate on alternate devices. I think we're going, we're, we've seen the heyday of the computers we know it now. And what we're going to see is uh, dynamic networking of all these multiple devices sharing information rather seamlessly, rather than being standalone devices that we're, we're treating them as today. I think that's where the puck's going to be in a couple years and we got to skate to where it's going to be rather than chasing after it. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you.